I created a Minecraft data pack that filled this entire Minecraft world with water, including the nether and end dimensions. And I plan on surviving 100 days in it on hard. Join me as we see just how much can be accomplished in this sunken realm. Upon spawning in for the first time, my immediate concern was finding an air pocket, since I could only hold my breath for 15 seconds. I scanned my surroundings and spotted some sugarcane, which provided a small but sufficient pocket for me to breathe in. My luck continued as I spotted a village located only 50 blocks away, which would prove to be useful for obtaining critical resources like wood and food. But I had underestimated the time it would take to swim to the village, and as a result lost half of my health. I wasn't too worried though, as there were many hay bales nearby which I could use to craft some bread. But while I was harvesting them, I was ambushed by a skeleton. Ignoring the fact that it was impossible for a skeleton to spawn in a completely submerged area, I quickly dodged his attacks and crafted some weapons using the wood and stone from a neighboring house. I was ready for him and landed the first blow, followed by an arrow straight to the chest, then another blow, and another arrow. The battle was tough, but I had something the skeleton didn't. A gaming chair. Thanks to my gaming chair, I was able to prevail and resume my harvest. After gathering more wood, I crafted some doors to use as makeshift air pockets and continued my journey out to sea, placing a temporary door each time I needed to replenish my air. As I explored the ocean, I came across a shipwreck stocked with valuables such as a buried treasure map, a leather helmet with projectile protection 4, and some minerals. The buried treasure also yielded more minerals, though nothing too crazy and a potion of water breathing that I never ended up using. At this point, I felt that I had enough resources to settle down and start searching for a place to call home. However, instead of finding a suitable location, I stumbled upon the smallest jungle in Minecraft and was immediately attacked by drowned from all angles. I had no choice but to seek refuge in a nearby cave where I found some coal and iron. I decided to do some mining, which I found to be easier as I didn't need to build pillars or mine staircases to get to hard to reach areas. This carried into day one, where I created a small smelting room for my fish and iron. Once all was smelted and crafted, I set my respawn point using a bed and ventured further down into the cave to see what else I could find, starting with a glow squid. I killed it and held its glow sack in my offhand to light up my surroundings. A few moments later, I found myself in a giant cave system filled to the brim with precious minerals like iron, gold, and lapis. But I was determined to find one thing in particular, and within a few minutes, I found them. And to my surprise, right next to a dungeon. I also found a Loyalty 3 book inside one of the dungeon chests, which was useless for now, but would come in handy much later when I'd get a trident. More mining brought me three more diamonds, which was enough to craft a diamond pickaxe and enchanting table. I crafted the pickaxe, then painfully stared at my inventory, which was fuller than a rich kid's stocking on Christmas Day, so I placed down a chest to use as temporary storage, then mined enough obsidian to cover what I'd need for a nether portal and enchanting table. I kept looking for diamonds, since they appeared to be somewhat common, when I was met by a drown equipped with a trident. At first, I thought I could take him, but I got scared and came back later with a shield. Sadly, he didn't drop the trident. Day 2 started off looking to be just as good, if not better, than day 1. I kept finding vein after vein of diamond ore. Even after I got lost due to my intoxication from the diamond dust, I ran into a vein while mining through the side of a cave wall. I couldn't find my way back though, so I spent the first part of day 3 mining my way back to the surface but now I had to go back down to retrieve some of my goodies I left behind by the dungeon. And on my way back down, I accidentally found another vein of diamonds. Thanks to coordinates, I made it back down and retrieved my loot. I got back out of the cave the same way I came in, and thought that now was finally the time to find a place to hunker down. No more distractions. I swam off in a new direction and harvested some wood and pufferfish on the way. Why pufferfish, you may ask? Well, you'll find out soon enough. On day 4, I was still swimming around and gathering fish. Things were admittedly slow given I could only move around by swimming, so I tried luring in some dolphins for dolphins grace, but I must have had dolphin cooties or something because they didn't seem to stick around for long. Eventually, I got bored of swimming and decided to make a small base in the floor of the ocean. 
My thinking was that when I'd find an actual place to base, I'd just transfer over my items through the nether, since nether travel is 8 times faster than the overworld. This led into day 5, where I finally crafted that enchanting table and a full set of protection 1 diamond armor with the sharpness 1 diamond sword. I went through the nether portal, which spat me out inside of a bunch of netherrack. However, I quickly mined my way out and found a bastion not long after. In the first chest I opened, I found a piece of netherite scrap, then found another piece of scrap along with two ancient debris, enough to craft a netherite ingot. By the way, in case you're wondering why mobs are spawning around the lava lake, that's because there are a few layers of air above the lake to prevent my game from crashing as a result of obsidian forming. This added layer of air gives enough room to spawn piglins, but I couldn't get a hold of any for trading, so I hightailed it out of there to start day 6. By now, I was quite annoyed with having to place doors for air every 15 seconds, so I went back into the nether to search for another fortress so that I could get some blaze rods and craft a brewing stand to brew water breathing potions. That was a mouthful. Once I found another fortress, I gathered some blaze rods, looted a few chests, and made my way back to the portal. Along the way, I managed to find and trap a piglin, but I didn't get any pearl traits from him, so I guess I'd have to come back later for those. I did get a lot of leather though, which I overlooked at the time, but am thankful for acquiring for reasons you'll find out later. On day 7, I went back to the nether to get those pearls. Despite taking practically the entire day to successfully find and trap a piglin, I did come out of it with 4 ender pearls. Not enough to go to the end, but enough to craft an ender chest which I used to temporarily store some of my loot for the next move. So, I spent all of day 8 swimming around the nether looking for a place to build a new portal. Since traveling through the nether is 8 times faster than the overworld, I was pretty confident that my exit portal would be somewhere in a new biome. On day 9, I finally found a spot that I felt was worthy of a portal. I built it next to a blaze spawner in a nether fortress in case I wanted to come back and farm blaze rods or build a weather skeleton farm. I took a quick peek outside of the fortress one last time before building the portal and jumping through. Back in the overworld, it looked like I was in an ice mountains biome, which could have been worse. But now it was nearly day 10, and I seriously couldn't procrastinate any further. So I picked out a spot on top of a mountain and started digging out an area under the grass to call home. I began day 10 by chopping down a bunch of spruce trees, but in the process, I spotted a village off in the distance. Since I hadn't really done anything yet, I packed up some of my things and ventured off to claim that village as my new home, permanently this time. The first thing I did when I got there was search the place for villagers, since I knew I'd need at least one at some point to acquire mending books. And to my surprise, there was still one left. In a desperate attempt, I tried to trap it and provide it with some air, but to no avail. Let's just hope that the villager is in a better place now. I searched the rest of the village, raiding the chests and deciding which house to claim as my own. I decided to settle with the one in the center, and began day 11 by transferring over my items from the neighboring mountaintop. Once all was transferred, I began clearing the place of all water using doors and dirt. It would have been a lot easier with sponges, but it was going to be a while before I'd get my hands on some of those. Since I couldn't easily increase the size of the house from the surface, I expanded it downwards, adding another level. I wanted the place to look somewhat nice, so I added a wooden floor and cobblestone walls. I then placed a bed, which I only used for aesthetic purposes since I felt kind of cheaty to sleep through every night just to reach the 100 day mark faster. Plus, I really wanted to push the limits and see how much I could accomplish within the allotted time. While adding a wall of chests, I ran out of wood and seeing how inefficient and laborious it was to swim outside and chop down trees, I started mining out an area big enough to grow my own trees underground. Once the room was done, I just needed bone meal to grow my saplings. But at this moment, I realized that I left all of my bone blocks in my ender chest, which was critical for making bone meal. And to make matters worse, I also left my spare ender pearls in there too, so I couldn't craft another. So, I had no choice but to make a new nether portal and travel back to the nether where I spent the rest of day 12 and all of day 13 mining gold and trading with piglins. And it wasn't until now that I finally understood how frustrating it was for speedrunners to depend on pure luck for acquiring ender pearls this way. At the end of day 13, my luck finally caught up to me with two pearl trades almost back to back. I immediately went back home and crafted an ender chest to start day 14 
where I retrieved my measly 13 bone blocks. To be honest, I thought I had more. I spent most of day 14 organizing my loot in the existing chests, topping it off with a bit of spruce tree farming. At this moment in time, I didn't know that hose broke leaves instantaneously, which is why you see me breaking the leaves with my fist. Now that I had a bunch of wood, I spent day 15 detailing the house, which consisted of finishing the ceiling, walls, and stairs, adding these cauldron plant thingies, and reflooring the second level with spruce wood instead of oak. Now that everything felt homier, I started working on a potato farm since I was currently surviving off of fish scraps. I made a couple of dirt platforms where my old tree farm was as a base for the farm, then threw up a small smelting room next to my nether portal. Unlike my tree farm, I turned the walls into cobblestone and fixed up the roof to make the area feel cozier. This carried into day 17, where I used a waterfall to moisturize the dirt and because I thought it looked cool. After fixing up the walls a bit more, I planted my first potatoes on the upper level and beetroot on the lower. But to properly finish this farm, I'd need to kickstart its growth with some bone meal. Since I already used all of the bone meal I had on getting wood, I went back into the nether where I spent the rest of the day gathering bone blocks. I also collected some glowstone to add variety to my lighting decor and some obsidian to center my nether portal. On day 18, I fixed up my nether portal and bone milled my crops, making sure to get plenty of potatoes. After cooking up enough potatoes to make a worthwhile journey somewhere, I geared up to go mining as I wanted to get out of the house for a bit and obtaining more precious metals would be worth my time. So I crafted up some extra doors and ventured off for a mining trip that I would never forget. The trip had a modest start. I entered a cave that led out right next to the village, collecting iron and coal at the upper levels before descending deeper and discovering a dungeon with a skeleton spawner. I marked down the coordinates so that I could come back later and make an XP farm. Moving on, the cave was dark and cramped and the ore deposits were scarce, but I did stumble upon diamonds while mining, which was a pleasant surprise. As I mined my way back to the surface, I heard the sound of a drown, which led me to a massive cave system, exactly what I had been searching for. I began mining with minimal interruptions, except for the occasional drown paying me a visit. On day 19, I discovered a section of the cave that intersected a vast abandoned mine shaft. It was an impressive sight, and I decided to hold off from exploring it until I'd gone everywhere else. While exploring, I noticed an increase in the number of drown, but I wasn't worried at first because their speed did not pose a threat, so I chose to continue my exploration without concern. After finishing mining the surrounding depths of the cave and finding an amethyst geode, I finally swam down to the abandoned mineshaft, eager to find even more precious minerals in some minecart chests. But I didn't really find much in them besides another dungeon and some melon seeds. So I left the mineshaft, which exited into a large dripstone cave, and this is where things took a turn for the worse. The cave was infested with drowned, and I found myself caught in the middle, running out of air. I attempted to place down a door as a barrier, but was ambushed by tridents raining down from above. In a state of panic, I swam away in search of a safe spot where I could recuperate my air and eat some food. I managed to place another door, but was quickly driven away again, this time by a baby drowned and a trident. In a desperate move, with my lungs filling with water, I decided to take a risk and placed one more door, eating food as fast as I could. Despite the incoming hits, I knew the regeneration from the baked potatoes would counteract some of the damage. With only one and a half hearts remaining and trident still flying at me, I swam faster than ever before and just barely escaped with my life. One more hit and I would have died. Terrified by what just went down, I concluded my mining trip and safely mined straight up to the surface, where I found the sun shining on a bright day 20. The near-death experience made me realize that even with full protection 1 diamond armor, I needed better enchantments to defend myself and navigate if I wanted to survive for the next 80 days. I collected some sugarcane on my way back to base, improved and expanded my smelting room, and spent the rest of the day gathering additional wood to rebuild the walls, floor, and ceiling. I began day 21 by clearing out a space at the edge of the smelting room to brew potions. Afterwards, I added a small window and some lighting, and the room was complete. However, in order to brew potions, I needed glass bottles, which required sand. Thus, I had to go out and gather some. Unfortunately, it was night at the time and I couldn't see, so I slept through the rest of the day, but that would be my only rest until the end of the series. 
The following morning, I collected sand from a nearby lake, made glass, and began brewing potions. The pufferfish I had collected on day 3 were now useful, as they were the key ingredient for brewing water breathing potions. I had two, which allowed me to make six water breathing potions that when extended with redstone dust combined for a total of 48 minutes of water breathing. I felt that now was a good time to start setting up my sugarcane farm, but I soon realized that I had no space for it. So I began clearing out an area adjacent to my potatoes to maintain symmetry. I attempted to make the design more efficient, but not having any prior experience, I made some mistakes. Nonetheless, I continued and finished detailing the area, including adding glowstone in the water holes for light. With my sugarcane farm set up, I moved on to the next step in enchanting, which was obtaining XP. On day 23, I constructed a tunnel to the dungeon I had discovered on day 18 during my near-death mining expedition. A portion of the tunnel led into a cave, so I sealed it off from the outside and drained the water to keep the path straight. Once complete, I mined straight down into the dungeon and began placing blocks to remove the existing water sources. By the time day 24 rolled around, I had finished clearing out all of the water. For the farm design, I chose a version that propelled the skeletons up through a water column and dropped them back down where they would be left with half a heart. Since I didn't have any kelp, I had to place a bucket of water at each level of the column for the bubbles to reach the top, and although it was a bit of an inconvenience, it was manageable. As I was constructing the drop shaft, I accidentally mined into an amethyst geode, which gave me an interesting idea. This led me to day 25, where I finished cleaning up the farm and expanded the amethyst killing floor, giving me a beautiful view of the interior of the geode. To make it easier to get back up, I constructed a second water column, bringing me to day 26. As I was working on the XP farm, I returned to my sugarcane farm a few times and found that things were going well. Too well, in fact, that it only made sense to find a creeper on one of my trips back down to the farm. Pushing that aside, building the second water column took a significant amount of time, stretching throughout the rest of the day. Nevertheless, it was worth it over building a staircase or ladder. With the arrival of day 27, I repaired the killing floor and the farm was finished. I now had accumulated 35 levels, so I was ready to start enchanting. However, for level 30, I needed 15 bookshelves. While I had enough leather for my piglin trades on day 6, I still lacked enough sugarcane and wood to craft the books and bookshelves. The wood shortage was easily fixed with bone meal, but for the sugarcane, I had to do some more waiting. To speed things up, I expanded the farm and collected more XP while waiting for the sugarcane to grow. On day 28, I did some more base work while periodically harvesting my sugarcane. I added a new area for more farm space next to my beetroots and continued the main staircase down since one of my goals was to have a staircase that reached bedrock. I found a couple of caves along the way and did a little exploring here and there, gathering lots of iron in the process. Shortly after reaching the deep slate levels, it became day 29, so I went back up to harvest all of the sugar cane that had grown while I was away. It was only enough to make 7 bookshelves, so I had a little more waiting to do. But I didn't want to be wasteful, so I used the deep slate I mined to replace the cobblestone walls, giving the area a much more polished and inviting atmosphere. A thought then dawned upon me. I needed a room for enchanting. So I chose a spot near the main staircase to begin mining out, and just as I had mined enough space, I had grown enough sugar cane to make the remaining bookshelves. To conclude the day, I returned to the new room and set everything up. Finally, I was able to enchant my equipment, but not before adding a nice tile floor, ceiling, and walls. Well, most of this wall. Here's what I got right out of the gate. Looting 3 on my sword, and respiration 3 on my helmet. Now I could hold my breath underwater for 60 seconds at a time. And making a quick trip to my XP grinder, I added on some Depth Strider 3 and Protection 4 boots. This was great so far, but my second trip to the grinder felt slow, so I decided to go into the nether and mine nether quartz instead, which ended up being much faster. I repeated this cycle a few times over the next couple of days, and by the end of day 31, this is what I had to show for. With my new gear, I went on another all-purpose mining trip, and I was racing through the caves. Respiration 3 and Aqua Infinity actually made mining in underwater caves easier than in regular ones. 
I also no longer had to worry about placing doors every 15 seconds, and I could mine underwater just as quickly as in air. And with my Fortune 3 pickaxe, I acquired all this ore within day 32. If you've never done this before, I highly recommend it, even in a regular world, since underwater caves still spawn in vanilla Minecraft. While smelting, I stubbed my toe on my bed and knew it was time to finally move it to its own designated room. But I didn't have enough deep slate to finish the walls, so I went mining again on day 33 to acquire more. But due to my fetish for mining diamonds, this turned into another full-blown mining expedition where I found another giant cave with a mineshaft at the center. But nothing could go wrong, right? Jokes aside, I did have a few more encounters with some drowned, but this time I actually killed them and even retrieved a trident. This felt like a good ending, so I made my way back home and admired all of the diamonds I collected. I had enough to make any gear I wanted, but I knew that the next thing I needed was mending. And in case you don't remember, I lost the only surviving villager back when I discovered this town on day 10, which meant that the only way I was going to get another villager was by curing a zombie villager. And since there was practically nowhere for any mobs to spawn, I decided to push that problem aside for a couple of days while I brainstormed. In the meantime, I spent day 34 focusing on further improving my base. I completed the decorating of the enchanting room, bedroom, and converted all of the neighboring stone and dirt to deep slate. Now everything looked polished on the upper floors, but this made my farms look ugly by comparison. So I went with a new minimalist design. I built these little rings surrounding blocks of glowstone framed in with wood. This not only looked nice, but made farming more practical, as I could just use bone meal if I wanted more of something. I also added a roof and converted the walls to deep slate to match the rest of my base, and it looked very nice. I then added a second layer to the farm for pumpkins and melons and spent day 36 creating a small area on the opposite side for the sugarcane. Unfortunately, I forgot to record day 36, which was spent working on the farm and acquiring deep slate. But on day 37, I planted all of the crops and finished all of the aesthetics. I also began building a chamber right under my enchanting room for mobs to spawn, in hopes of getting a zombie villager to spawn. But checking in on day 38, all I found were two creepers. I knew that unless I had a large enough chamber, getting zombie villagers this way would almost certainly never happen. So I devised a plan, a sky platform. See, my entire world was filled with water, but only up to Minecraft's height limit of 320. This meant that if I made a platform at y equals 320, I could create an efficient spawning space for all hostile mobs without any need to mine. But before I could begin, I had a desire to go back to the nether and find another bastion, which I did. And it wasn't a complete waste of time, as I did get a lot of gold blocks, 29 to be exact, and a couple of pieces of netherite scrap. With no more cravings, I got to work on day 39. I picked a spot behind my house and placed a soul sand and magma block so that I could get up and down safely since the bubble columns provided air. I took a test run and stood with my head over the water for the first time. After making a pillar, I started creating the spawning platform. All went well, besides the freaking phantoms that kept spawning while I was trying to build. I mean seriously, what was Mojang thinking with this mob? After that miserable night of fighting phantoms, I finally finished the platform on day 40 without any more interruptions. Now all I had to do was wait until nightfall to see just how well this platform would work. As night approached, I set sail across the surface of the world, taking in the sights of the surrounding terrain. To my surprise, I discovered another village, but unfortunately, there weren't any surviving villagers. Upon my return to the platform, I was met with hordes of mobs spawning. Skeletons, zombies, creepers, and spiders. My plan had worked, but the sheer number of mobs made me realize that I needed a better bow with stronger enchantments. The old crossbow I had found in a chest was no longer going to cut it. With this in mind, I ventured into the nether to gain more XP and enchant my weapons. By day 41, I had accumulated enough experience to enchant a new bow with flame and power 3. While it could have been better, it would still suffice. After some more mindless exploration, night fell again and I returned to the platform. However, this time, after spending a minute or so fighting the mobs, I realized that I didn't have any weakness potions or golden apples to cure any zombie villagers that might spawn. 
As a result, I had to go back down again to brew some. This didn't leave me much time to cycle through the remaining waves of mobs, so I needed to find something else to do until the next night rolled in. One task that I had been putting off for a while was expanding the tree farm. With all of the wood I was using for base renovations, relying on one sapling at a time was pretty slow. So I made use of the extra time I had on day 42 to expand the area to accommodate for a long line of saplings instead of just one. I finished just as the night rolled in, so I grabbed all of my stuff and made my way back up to the platform, everything ready this time. Less than a minute after being up there, I got my first zombie villager spawn. I trapped it in a boat and kept killing the mobs trying to force another spawn. Unfortunately, I didn't get any more, but that would soon be the least of my worries. Just as the 43rd morning came about, a pack of phantoms spawned in and distracted me long enough for the zombie villager to start burning in the daylight. In a panic, I broke the boat and part of the platform to let the zombie villager into the water so he would stop burning. But instead of bouncing on top of the water like any other mob, he started sinking. In a desperate attempt, I started punching him to try to get him back up to the surface, but it wasn't enough. I lost him. Great, now I had to wait another day just for another chance at a zombie villager. But just like before, I stayed productive and used the extra time to organize my chests. And before I knew it, it was night again. While fighting the mobs, I used my boat and bow to kill them from a safe distance. I got a couple of endermen spawns, but unfortunately no zombie villagers. On day 44, I checked my old mob chamber under my base just in case, but I got poisoned instead. And to make matters worse, the zombies broke right through the chamber door and stormed up my stairs. I took care of them, but was rewarded with another 30 seconds of poison. This probably would have been the worst start to any day had I not accumulated enough experience points from the previous night's slaughter to enchant a new Sharpness Force sword. With only a small amount of dignity left, I went down to my skeleton grinder to get some more arrows for the next night. At around 4am that night, while dealing with phantoms, I spotted a sinking zombie villager, just like the first one I found. But I wasn't going to let the same thing happen as before. I quickly used cobblestone for my inventory to build a pillar down from the platform, catching the zombie villager just in time to place down a door giving him some air. With a sigh of relief, I watched the sunrise of day 45 and initiated the curing process for the villager. I took no chances and closely monitored the process until it was complete. Next, I retrieved some additional books from my base and constructed a small room for the villager. The room was just large enough to accommodate a bed and lectern. By the time the villager was settled in, it was already nighttime again, and I knew I'd need at least one more villager to acquire emeralds for trading for a mending book. Although that didn't happen, I was able to secure a mending trade from the villager that day. That night, I returned to the platform to continue my quest for another villager, but I noticed something strange. A ring of ice had formed around the platform, which must have begun spreading while I was constructing the cocoon for the mending villager. Anyway, a zombie villager spawned within the first few minutes, and then another one popped out of nowhere. Although I only needed one more villager, I didn't reject the second. I initiated the curing process on both of the zombie villagers, and soon they were back to normal. I considered what profession to assign the first villager, and ultimately decided to make him a farmer. However, I soon discovered that the first villager was a nimwit and unable to change his profession, so I turned to the second villager, who gladly took it. 16 carats for an emerald sounded fair, so I went with that trade. The final thing I needed to complete the trade was a lot of books. Since I already used all of my leather to make an enchanting table, I had to either go out and get more leather, or find books elsewhere. My first attempt was to fish for leather. After 17 casts and catching 4 puffer fish, I attempted to increase my chances by enchanting my fishing rod with Lure 2. Unfortunately, this too did not yield any leather, only a pair of worn out leather boots. I don't know whether it was the bad luck or the phantoms reaching me under the ice that brought me to quit this method, but I got the heck out of there on day 49. No more fishing for me. Fortunately, I had another plan for getting books. Shipwrecks. See, shipwrecks with a map chest have a 34.5% chance of spawning with 1-5 to five books, so if I went out to the ocean searching shipwrecks, it would only be a matter of time before I had all the books I needed. The first shipwreck I found held 4 books, but due to lag, I accidentally left them behind. It's okay though, because I came back later to grab them. 
Resuming my journey, I stumbled upon an ocean monument. To be honest, I had not considered searching for sponge until this point, but I knew that I wouldn't get anywhere with mining fatigue, so until I figured out a way to handle that, I marked down the coordinates and left the sponge for another day. I once again forgot to record on day 50, so here's a brief summary. I made a tunnel in the nether connecting the portal to the ocean monument to the portal to my base. Afterwards, I continued searching for shipwrecks for books, finding only two more before discovering a village on day 51. Luckily, this village had a library with bookshelves made up of 18 books. Seeing as this would be all the books I'd need and more to apply mending to my gear, I concluded the journey and sailed back home. Now I had everything I needed to acquire and apply mending, but with one catch. I didn't have a reliable source for XP. My skeleton farm was too slow, and manually mining quartz in the nether also wasn't efficient. I needed a way to acquire large amounts of XP quickly, and a standard mob farm wouldn't suffice. I needed something that would complement my water-based world, and I could only think of one farm that fit the profile. A guardian farm. It was the most logical choice really, because I needed sponge anyway and already had a tunnel in the nether connecting my base to an ocean monument. Plus, a guardian farm would provide me with puffer fish to brew more water breathing potions. So the next steps were clear. Take out the elder guardians, grab the sponge, and build a guardian farm out of the monument. But in order to do all of this, I needed a way to get around the mining fatigue. Now, normally I'd use milk, but this obviously wasn't going to work since all of the cows in my world went extinct, so I had to use another strategy. A strategy which only became possible in the Caves and Cliffs update. Axolotls. To keep things brief, axolotls rid your character of mining fatigue whenever you kill the mob they're fighting. This means that if I bring an axolotl with me to the ocean monument and kill whatever it's fighting, I will be cleared of any mining fatigue given by the Elder Guardians, allowing me to harvest the sponge and leave the monument. So, I set out to find a lush cave biome, as this is where I would find axolotls. I kept a lookout for a mangrove tree, since they always mark the location of a lush cave. On day 52, I was still searching for a lush cave biome, but couldn't find a single mangrove anywhere. I don't recall it ever being this difficult, and I was surprised that I was struggling to find just one. I looked at the wiki and found that they often spawn underneath biomes with high humidity values, so I swam over to a jungle biome and descended into a crevice where I found some moss blocks. And sure enough, on the other side lay a lush cave. Throughout the cave, I captured five axolotls, made an exit portal, and traveled back to my base to prepare for the next steps. On day 53, I crafted an efficiency 2 hoe to break the sponge blocks faster, and I was ready to enter the monument. Upon breaking in, I was inflicted with the mining fatigue effect. I spawned an axolotl and started slaying all the elder guardians. Although my mining fatigue didn't go away with every kill, it dissipated often enough for me to find and collect the sponge and gold blocks. By the end of it, I had acquired 28 pieces of sponge, which wasn't a lot, but I still had a few axolotls with me, so I swam over to another ocean monument and repeated the process. However, this attempt did not go as smoothly, and I'd rather not elaborate on why. Instead, I'll just say that the mission was a success, as I managed to acquire 30 more pieces of sponge, and on day 54, I had a total of 58 freshly cooked pieces. The next step in preparing for the Guardian Farm was to acquire all the necessary materials, which included a large amount of glass and obsidian. I spent the rest of the day acquiring the glass, starting with digging up several stacks of sand, then smelting it. On day 55, I hopped into the nether and mined two stacks of obsidian and three and a half stacks of soul sand. The obsidian would be for the nether portal teleporters, and the soul sand for bubble columns. On day 56, I went back to the jungle to collect some bamboo for scaffolding, which I'd use to prevent mob cramming since guardian farms are supposed to have such a high spawn rate that entity cramming kicks in and starts killing the guardians. The next step in preparation for the guardian farm was to acquire two sticky pistons, but I had no slime balls and didn't know how to get them, so I had to devise a plan. I thought about the jungle where I just gathered a whole bunch of bamboo and realized that there were probably a bunch of temples hidden throughout, which always spawn with three sticky pistons. And since I only needed two, one temple was all I needed. So on day 57, I searched the humongous jungle but could not for the life of me find one. Night fell and I was still swimming around with no luck. 
This was like the mangrove thing all over again. So I tried a different approach. I swam up to the top of the world and looked down. And boy, I wish I had done that sooner, because I found not one, but two temples, all within a matter of seconds. So I shot back down, grabbed the goodies, and arrived back at the house on day 58 to finish prepping for the farm. Most of the day just consisted of me crafting, which I won't bore you with, so I'll skip to day 59 where the building begins. The farm design I chose is from Ian Zofor, if that's how you pronounce his name, so all credit goes to him. The first thing I did was place soul sand over one of the corners of the monument. This creates a bubble column that pushes the guardians up. The next thing I did was create the portal chamber. This chamber is responsible for capturing the guardians pushed up by the bubbles and teleporting them to the nether. In case you're wondering about the small patch of cobblestone on the roof, it's because I ran out of glass. Using my sponge, I removed all of the water from the chamber so that the guardians would flop around until they touched another portal, teleporting them to the nether. I had to make a quick trip back home on day 60 to gather more sand for glass. After smelting around three and a half stacks, and one day later, I returned to the ocean monument to work on the next section, the slaughter chamber and drop shaft. This part of the farm is responsible for dropping the guardians down a long shaft where they take enough fall damage after reaching the bottom, such that they die with one swipe of a sword. The nether portal at the top of the shaft is the exit for the guardians once they've re-entered the overworld from the nether after their first teleport from the collection chamber. After spending the rest of the day shoveling and smelting more sand into glass, I encased the slaughter chamber and set up the chests for the drops, because spoiler alert, there were going to be a lot of them. Lastly, I soaked up the remaining water in the chamber and shaft, and this part of the farm was essentially complete. Now the last part of the farm I needed to make was the portion in the nether, but to make the portal for my drop shaft link up, I had to build it at the same Y coordinate, which lay above the bedrock ceiling. I'd also need to break the bedrock ceiling so that I could get back down. How would I accomplish this? Well, I'll show you. I grabbed some more ender pearls and more sand. Not to make glass, but TNT, which was key for breaking the bedrock. After reaching the bedrock ceiling, I found a thin spot, placed some ladders, and used my ender pearl to teleport right through. Awesome, step one was done. Now it was time for step two, breaking the bedrock. To make this work, I had to make this funky looking setup with TNT and a piston, and place another piston at the exact moment the TNT blew up. This failed the first time, so I tried again and was happy to see that it worked, although it broke the wrong block. I tried again, failed again, and then finally succeeded on the second try, just like before. Sweet, now I had a hole for crossing through the ceiling. On day 64, I started working on the nether portion of the farm. The purpose of this room was to hold the guardians that came through the nether portal for a few moments, then release them back into the portal I built atop my drop chamber. I made a simple hopper clock connected to the fence gates to hold and release them back into the portal in waves. Just like I did in the first part of the farm, I filled the room with scaffolding to prevent mob cramming, otherwise the guardians would die. By the end of the day, I finished the room, marking the completion of the farm. So I went to the drop shaft and waited, but nothing came out. You see, because the farm uses nether portals, and because I had other nether portals around, it was kind of screwing up the teleportation. So I had to remove my old portal in the nether to establish the proper link. So on day 65, I broke the portal at the end of my nether tunnel, which was contaminated with rabid guardians, and swam back to the drop shaft, hopeful to see some guardians pop out, but they never did. This time, I found the guardian stuck in the room above the bedrock ceiling in the nether. The root cause for this turned out to be faulty redstone, as I had used regular pistons instead of sticky pistons for the clock. I swapped them out and went back to the drop shaft again, and I was happy to see that all was working. But before I could indulge in sending the guardians to heaven, I needed one more thing. A sweeping edge 3 sword so I could take out an entire wave with one swipe. Since I was only level 25 at the time, I had to return to the nether on day 66 to mine nether quartz, but it would be for the last time. I hit level 30, enchanted my sword, and eagerly arrived back at the drop shaft. I took my first swipe and went from level 27 to 31. It was just as OP as I'd imagined. I took a few more celebratory swings until I hit level 40, then returned back to my base to work on obtaining the mending books. Now, since I cured a zombie villager, the mending trade only cost one emerald and a book.
but during this playthrough, I didn't know that and thought that I needed 14 emeralds. So throughout the rest of the day, instead of jumping straight into the mending books, I farmed a few dozen or so stacks of carrots. This task was made easy with my fortune 3 pickaxe and some bone meal. I then traded these carrots with the farmer villager I had cured on day 47 in exchange for 16 emeralds. I also attempted to breed the farmer with a nitwit villager, but it appears that the nitwit didn't know how to successfully breed, as I never saw a baby. Nonetheless, I began day 67 with some more carrot farming, followed by another trade for 16 more emeralds. Now, remember how I said it was newbie of me to think that I needed so many emeralds despite just needing one for the trade? Well, to put the icing on the cake, I had 28 more emeralds in my chest already, bringing my new total to 60. At the time, I still didn't think that it was enough because the assumption of a 14 emerald trade meant that I could only get 4 mending books. So I continued farming but also took some time at the end of the day to collect sand for more glass and make some patchwork repairs at my guardian farm. I also set up some more chests to collect the prismarine and fish drops. On day 68, I finished tweaking the drop shaft, then went back to base to get those mending books. I traded the rest of my carrots for emeralds and went to the librarian. I shift clicked the trade expecting to receive 4 or 5 books, but instead I received 12. For the rest of the day, I focused on maximizing the enchantments on my armor, so I crafted, enchanted, and combined fresh pieces of diamond armor. This process greatly reduced my levels, so on day 69, I went back to the XP farm to replenish them. In fact, I had to make two more trips in days 69 and 70 to complete most of my armor and tool sets, including the trident I found all the way back on day 33. After that, I threw some fish on the smokers and took a third trip to the farm and watched the XP repair my gear, which has gotta be one of the most satisfying things in Minecraft. I also practiced throwing the trident at some pigmen, which was way more fun than using a bow. At the end of it all, this is what I had. So by now you're probably wondering why I haven't gone to slay the ender dragon yet. After all, I could have done it much earlier in the series, but I wanted to save it for the end as a sort of epic finale. And right now, I still wasn't quite there because I was still wearing mostly diamond armor when what I really needed was netherite armor, and that's exactly what I'd get. Now, there were three ways I could go about acquiring netherite. The first was looting bastions, but I didn't want to swim around aimlessly with my fingers crossed to find bastions stocked with ancient debris and netherite, so I discarded that idea. The next two possibilities consisted of two different methods of mining, bed mining and strip mining. I had successfully done bed mining in the past, which is when you place and explode a bed in the nether, so I decided to go with that option. I brewed some fire resistance potions to protect me from the lava and fire underground, then crafted some beds and headed back over to the nether to start day 71. I found my first piece of ancient debris after the first couple of beds, three more after the next two beds, and another three after the fifth bed. I couldn't believe the luck I was having, and if that wasn't lucky enough, I found two more pieces immediately after mining a 2x2 tunnel. Within the first 10 minutes, I found 9 ancient debris. When smelted and combined with gold, this would give me 2 netherite ingots, capable of converting 2 diamond pieces. However, my luck quickly dried up and I was out of beds, so I went back to my base to make some more. But I had no wool or string. I checked the time and saw that it was night, so I swam back up to the mob platform to farm spiders for string, which I could then use to craft wool for beds. And as fun as it was to use my trident to kill dozens of mobs, besides phantoms of course, I only came out of it with enough string to make 5 beds the next morning. And to make matters worse, I didn't find a single piece of ancient debris with any of those beds, so I had to resort to strip mining. Thankfully, because my pickaxe had mending, I could repair it with the experience dropped by mining nether quartz, which until this point I had only used to level up. While it certainly felt slower than bed mining, I eventually found another couple of pieces, but lost one due to lava before I could pick it up, and I thought this stuff was supposed to be fireproof. On day 74, after 3 days of mining, I had extracted a total of 23 pieces of ancient debris. Combined with the 12 pieces already in my chest from previous trips and bastions, I had enough materials to create 8 netherite ingots. This was sufficient to convert the rest of my armor as well as 5 tools. However, I only converted my sword and two pickaxes for the time being. Now remember how just a few minutes ago I said I didn't want to go to the end until I had netherite? Well, now I was ready. 
I just needed to do a few more things. Because I was interested in not just killing the Ender Dragon, but also exploring the N Islands for Shulkers and Elytra, I was going to need to bring a lot of water breathing potions. So I brewed three sets and extended them to eight minutes each. The next item I needed was a bow, as my trident wouldn't be reliable for shooting the dragon high in the sky. So I enchanted a fresh bow with power three and infinity, which was great since I didn't have many arrows left and I didn't want to spend time in a skeleton grinder to collect more. Now there was one more thing I needed to make, Eyes of Ender. Fortunately, I collected a lot of pearls throughout my time spent farming mobs on the sky platform, so I crafted 16 eyes, which felt like more than enough. I also crafted some extra doors with me as a reserve for the water breathing potions, and upgraded my diamond axe to netherite with efficiency 5, unbreaking 3, and mending. Now I was finally ready. I swam up to the platform and the day was bright. I threw the first eye, then the second, and tried using one of those triangulation sheets to pinpoint the location of the stronghold. That didn't work, so I went off to find the stronghold the old fashioned way. Before long, I threw an eye and it flew backwards, so I picked a spot and started mining straight down, which was a safe thing to do on this particular type of world, and soon fell into a stronghold. On the bedrock version of the game, it's possible for a stronghold to spawn without an end portal, but on Java, it isn't. Despite this, I struggled more than ever to locate the end portal. Everywhere I went, door after door, either led to a dead end or somewhere I had already been. In desperation, I threw some more eyes to see if they would direct me to the portal chamber, but that turned out to be a waste of time and eyes. I even found diamond ore in the process, believe it or not. It wasn't until much later on day 76 that I found the library, and 13 minutes after entering the stronghold that I finally found the portal. Just think, in the amount of time it took me to find the portal after entering the stronghold, speedrunners have beat the entire game on random seeds. Anyway, after clearing the portal room of all the water with my sponge, I built another portal and marked down the coordinates so that I know how to get back should something happen. Then it was time. I lit the portal and jumped in. On the other side, I found myself falling to my death and with all of my items gone, that marks the end of the series. Just kidding. I don't know what happened, but I didn't actually die. After almost having a heart attack, I swam up to the obsidian pillars and started destroying the end crystals with my trident. All was going well until I reached the ninth crystal. I missed it with my trident and it flew off into the void, lost forever. How stupid of me. I didn't even think that could happen. But whatever, I took out the last crystal with my bow and flew up to the surface of the world where the dragon was hanging around. For whatever reason, the return portal was up there too. Well, I guess I'd be fighting from there. Once I reached the top, I saw that the top of the portal was broken. Hopefully this wouldn't be a problem. In a rather anticlimactic manner, I chipped the dragon's health down with my bow for a minute before finishing it off with my sword once it perched. And just like that, I beat the game. Sadly, there was no egg, but at least the portal generated so that I could go home. But I wasn't done yet. I still needed to find Elytra. So I threw an ender pearl in the end gateway and started swimming. After seven and a half minutes of searching, I got trolled with the world's smallest end city. I still swim up to it though to get the shulker shells when I was pleasantly surprised by not one, but two large end cities with ships. When I swam up to the first city though, I didn't find any shulkers. In fact, it looked like they all drowned because their shells were left floating about. So I scooped them up, grabbed some banners and rods, and approached the first real city. I looted the chests I came across, but most of the items were junk because they were cursed. Not to worry though, since there was one thing I wanted that I knew was there. Upon swimming to the ship, I heard Shulker and Enderman noises from underneath. After entering the lower deck, I was surprised to see a pocket of air filled with Shulkers and Endermen defending the Elytra. They were no match for my gear though, and I took them out with ease and claimed my prize. At last, I had Elytra. Oddly enough, on my way to the other end city, I saw yet another ship, but I wasn't going to bother with that one since I already had enough junk sitting in my Shulkers and Ender chest. After grabbing the next pair of elytra and scooping up the shulker shells from the city, I started making my way back to the main island, but I didn't use the gateway, so I swam across the void between the outer islands and the main one. On day 78, I finally reached the main island and jumped through the portal to get back home. 
I used the shulker shells to craft six shulker boxes, which I then dyed red because I hate the default color. I then went back into the nether to create a tunnel connecting my base portal to the stronghold one, and I was shocked to see that it was less than 50 blocks away. I entered the stronghold and retrieved all of the sponge I had left earlier, so I could begin a new farm for wither skeletons, because how could I spend 100 days in a Minecraft world without obtaining a beacon? After all, it was only day 78. How hard could it be? I picked out a spot for the farm right next to the stronghold portal, because the area was already closed off on three sides and it was mere seconds away from my base portal. I took a quick run to and from my base for blocks and got straight to work. Now, unlike my guardian farm, there wasn't going to be anything technical about this. My plan was to simply construct platforms for wither skeletons to spawn on, and then manually kill them using my looting 3 sword. However, these platforms needed to be constructed using nether bricks, so I spent a large amount of time mining them out from one of the fortress's hallways. On day 79, I completed the first spawning cell and removed all the water using sponge. One of the benefits of being in the nether is that sponge blocks always remain dry, so I didn't need to return to the overworld and dry them out in a furnace before reusing them. After testing the spawn rate of the cell, I was disappointed to find that only three blazes spawned. So, I began constructing additional cells. After building the third one, I created a long tunnel where I could run down to despawn mobs that I didn't want to fight, so they wouldn't impede the mob cap and allow me to farm wither skeletons more efficiently. On day 80, I tested the spawn rates again with my new tunnel, and I was pleased with the new results. I just needed luck on my side, because I had not yet received a single skull drop, but that quickly changed as I received two skull drops within a minute of each other. It was strange, but I was glad to finally make some progress in my quest for a beacon. Adding on to the weirdness, I didn't get my third skull drop until over 10 minutes later on day 81. Talk about being overdue. But whatever, I had the skulls I needed to spawn the wither, but now the question was where would I spawn it? I could do it deep underground somewhere, or in the bedrock ceiling in the nether, which is usually what I did. However, I wanted to try something new, so I went with this end portal method I found online, where you're supposed to spawn the wither underneath the end portal in the end dimension, and it'll get stuck in the bedrock for you to easily kill. I followed the tutorial exactly and spawned the wither, and as soon as I took the first swing of my sword, the wither no clipped through the end portal and started flying around the water shooting its heads at me. Well, this backfired. I pulled out my bow and started dealing chip damage to the wither, but it was no use, and I had to keep retreating to regenerate my health, which also gave the wither time to regenerate its health. I knew I couldn't win like this, so I had no choice but to return back to my base and strategize. After taking a moment to think, I devised a simple and straightforward plan. On day 82, I crafted a number of instant health 2 potions and strength 2 potions. If I was going to defeat the wither, I would have to tank through its damage and kill it with my sword. After returning to the battle, my plan appeared to be working. I kept chugging health potions and eating fish to regenerate my health, and I drank a strength potion after the wither reached half health, looking to finish it off. But the wither never came down. Instead, it stayed far above the water out of my sword's reach, spamming heads at me. I was forced to retreat once more. So my first two plans didn't work. That's okay, because I had plan C, Elytra. If the wither wanted to fight while flying, so could I. I spent a few minutes enchanting my Elytra with Unbreaking 3 and Mending, and crafted some firework rockets out of the spare gunpowder I acquired from the sky platform. Now I was as ready as I'd ever be. I started the battle just like before, using my bow to bring the wither's health down to 50%. As soon as he did, he flew down, which gave me the opportunity to deal some blows with my sword. I needed to regenerate, so after taking a bite of fish, I came back up and the wither dropped down again, so I started hitting it again. After getting a nasty combo, I killed it and picked up the nether star. I didn't even have to fly. I went straight back home and used a nether star I fought so valiantly for to craft a beacon. It was beautiful. So beautiful, in fact, that it deserved the highest tier, which consisted of a 164 block pyramid. But since I only had 78 blocks, I had a bit of mining to do. So after topping off the day repairing my gear at the Guardian farm, I packed up some shulkers for extra storage and began day 83 by venturing off with my elytra. I was looking for a mesa biome because they have boatloads of gold, which I could then turn into blocks for my beacon. 
After flying west for a few thousand blocks, I finally reached the end of the ocean and found a mesa biome right next to a coral reef, but it was far too small and wouldn't do me any good for mining. On the lookout, I also found a pillager outpost. I didn't have any totems of undying, so I swooped in to see if I could change that. But there weren't any pillagers to be seen, so I carried on with my search for a proper mesa. On the morning of day 84, I discovered another mesa biome, this time large enough to be worthy of exploring. I spotted an opening in the ground and went right on in. Just as I had hoped, there was gold everywhere, so I didn't waste any time. I also mined any iron I came across since I could also use that for the beacon. With my fortune 3 pickaxe, I'd have enough blocks to max out that beacon in no time. After mining for a bit, I ran into a large dripstone cave littered with drowned. This was good because it meant more gold and a chance at getting a new trident, which I so tragically lost not long ago. While killing the drowned, I came across one that was holding a nautilus shell. And right then is when I thought it'd be a great idea to start collecting them so that I could craft a conduit later on. By day 85, I had amassed so much gold and iron that I shifted my focus toward obtaining nautilus shells and a new trident. I also found a very awkward looking dungeon that I just wanted to show you all. By the end of that day, right after collecting my 7th nautilus shell, I got a trident drop. And shortly after that, my 8th and 9th shells. Now my mission was complete. I had enough gold and iron to max out the beacon, I had enough nautilus shells for a conduit, and I had a brand new trident. On day 86, I left the caves and threw up another portal to speed up my travel back home. While swimming across a giant lava lake, I saw some striders and figured I'd attempt to ride one with a saddle I had found in that weird dungeon from earlier. But after hopping onto the little critter, I realized that I couldn't go anywhere without a warped fungus on a stick, so I threw that idea out the window and quickly arrived back at my base portal, marking the end of the trip. But while looking through my loot, I couldn't find my shulker box I'd filled with all the gold I'd mined. I checked through all of my chests, and it was gone. In a panic, I looked at my past recordings and took a sigh of relief when I saw that I left it behind when I tried to ride that strider. That was okay, at least it wasn't all the way back in the mesa biome. On my way to retrieve the box, I found a bastion tucked away inside the walls of the nether that held an additional 5 blocks of gold and a piece of ancient debris. That extra piece of ancient debris was actually huge because I could combine it with three other pieces in my base to craft another netherite ingot. Maybe I should leave stuff behind more often. After recovering my shulker box and returning home, I threw all of my gold and iron in the furnaces and waited for them to smelt. In the meantime, I checked my chest for a heart of the sea, as I swore I grabbed one when looting a buried treasure earlier in the series. In fact, after checking the footage, I did, but I threw it out on day one to make room for inventory space. Well, it looks like I was going to have to go find another one. But before doing so, I wanted to enchant my new trident and apply mending to it and some of my other tools. So I farmed some more carrots, traded for some more emeralds that once again I didn't need, and picked up three mending books from the librarian. Interestingly, on one of my trips up to the villagers, I found a wandering trader walking along on the ice surrounding the platform. He didn't have any good trades or anything, but I thought it was interesting. After getting back down, I smelted that bit of ancient debris I accidentally found the previous day and combined it with my other scraps to make a netherite ingot, which I used to create a netherite hoe, which actually gave me an advancement that read reevaluate your life choices. Trust me, I do that on a daily basis. After all of my items were enchanted, I swung by the guardian farm and repaired everything. By now it was day 88, and everything had finished smelting. I took all the remaining gold and iron from my chest and combined them, totaling a staggering 209 blocks, 45 more than I needed. But I didn't want to build the bacon pyramid until I had a conduit up and running, so I swam out to the ocean and searched for a new shipwreck. This took a little longer than anticipated, seeing as most of my search took place at night, so it wasn't until 89 that I actually found one. I took the treasure map, flew over to the X, and retrieved a heart of the sea. On my way back home, I also picked up a bunch of prismarine shards from my guardian farm to use as building blocks in the town, because I couldn't end this series without spicing up the place. I started clearing out the little igloos and farms around my house to make the area more spacious, then built a temporary frame and activated the conduit, giving me permanent water breathing within the vicinity of the town. Now I'd be able to build without having to worry about placing doors or chugging water breathing potions. But I was still missing a critical building block. Coral. 
Because this is an underwater world, I had to get some. Fortunately, I had coordinates written down from day 83 when I found a coral reef while crossing the ocean. So all I had to do was travel a small ways through the nether and build an exit portal to let me out into the coral reef. Using my silk touch pickaxe, I collected a good amount of coral until I got bored. Then dug out a bunch of sand on the ocean floor so that I wouldn't have to make any more runs for glass, since I did want to build a few extra houses with windows around the town. On day 91, I organized all of my loot and shulker boxes for building, and chopped down a bunch of wood, since I was going to need a lot of it for what I planned to do for that beacon. Once I had enough, I went outside and picked a spot for the beacon. I had to demolish one of the village houses to make space for it, but that was okay because the build I was about to make was going to make up for it 10 times over. Next, I built the beacon pyramid, which consisted of mostly gold blocks topped off with iron. Finally, I placed the beacon, and for my buffs, I chose speed and haste. Because up until this point, I thought that speed didn't affect swimming, but apparently it does as long as you're wearing Depth Strider boots. I wonder then how much time I could have saved traveling in this series had I brewed a bunch of speed potions. All buffed up, I began day 92 by building a house across from mine. I went with a simple design that blended in well with the other village houses. I removed all of the water from the interior, lit it up with torches, and hung some lanterns on the exterior. Now that I was all warmed up, I chopped down a little bit more wood and started the next day working on the beacon build. And once I started, I did not stop until the whole thing was complete at the end of day 94. So here's a brief time lapse of the construction during each day. And here's the final result. Let me know your thoughts in the comments and I might upload some building related content in the future. With the village road in need of improvement, my next task was to focus on the lighting. The existing lamp posts were functional, but could be improved, so I decided to implement a new design, simple just like the house. While doing this, I also cut down trees that were awkwardly placed along the path. I'd be using something else later anyway. On day 95, I started revamping the village roads. To achieve this, I utilized pieces of prismarine that I had collected from the guardian farm and placed them along the roads. This raised their contrast and added a bit of color. I had to make a quick trip back to the farm to restock on Prismarine and took a brief moment to repair my tools as well. After finishing the road on day 96, I moved the conduit over to where the fountain used to be and started placing down the coral I gathered on day 90. I didn't have a lot of it, so I had to be smart with how large and dense the formations were. I hoped by the end of this that it wouldn't look horrible. And on day 97, after placing all of the blocks with the plant variants, this was the end result. And I think it came out pretty well. There were still some parts of the town that looked empty though, so I picked up a bunch of wood I accidentally left at the guardian farm and used it to build two new houses on day 98. With some slight variation of course, because I didn't want to make the same exact house three times. For the first house, I left the spruce logs unstripped and used polished blackstone for the foundation. For the second house, I went with the same design as the first I built on day 92. And using some extra bits of prismarine, I detailed the conduit frame so that it wasn't bland anymore. On day 99, I was looking through my chests and saw that I still had a netherite ingot. The only tool I had left that wasn't netherite was my shovel, and I figured that completing the set would be cool, so I threw mending on my shovel and upgraded it to netherite. And to my disappointment, I didn't get an advancement for it. Anyway, I put mending on my silk touch pickaxe, then hopped over to the guardian farm and watched every item in my inventory fully repair. But before going home, I hit level 50 and used the rest of the prismarine from the chest to craft a bunch of sea lanterns, which I used to light up the road so that every inch of the village could be seen at night. I even lit up the platform with some extra lanterns I had left over. And after placing that last lantern, I stood on top of my house and soaked up the view. I was done. 100 days later, and I did all of this. I took a victory lap around the town, reminiscing on everything I did throughout the series, and knew there was one more thing I needed to do, which I had been putting off for practically the entire series. I swam back to my house, walked into my bedroom, and finally had a good night's sleep. Well folks, that's the series. I hope you enjoyed this hour-long journey with me, and it means so much that you stuck around until the end of the video. YouTube is a relatively new passion of mine, and seeing people enjoy the work that I do means the world to me. This video is probably the biggest project I've ever completed, 
and I see it as a starting point for a new chapter in my YouTube career, so subscribe if you want to see what comes next. And with all that said, thank you for watching, this is LED, switching off.